Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the CME activity, Management of Atopic Dermatitis in the Primary Care Setting. I'm Dr. Paul DeGramji, Family Physician at Collegeville Family Practice in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, and Medical Director of Health Services at Ursinus College, also in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. The purpose of this program is to discuss the diagnosis and management of atopic dermatitis in the primary care setting, including the role of shared decision-making can play in improving patient satisfaction and ultimately patient outcomes. This activity has been developed in association with the National Eczema Association and their Coalition United for Better Eczema Care Initiative, or CUBE-C. Joining me in this discussion today are Dr. Robert Sidbury, Megan Lewis, a nurse practitioner, and Rayel, a patient with atopic dermatitis. Dr. Sidbury, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Robert Sidbury. I'm a pediatric dermatologist at Seattle Children's Hospital and the University of Washington. Welcome, Robert. And Megan. Hi, my name's Megan Lewis. I'm a nurse practitioner at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in the allergy department. Hello, Megan. And Rayel. Hi, I'm Rayel, and I'm a, a patient of atopic dermatitis. Um, I've had it since I was born. Well, welcome all for being here. Well, folks, we all know that atopic dermatitis is chronic, relapsing disease of the skin, and it's most commonly seen in infancy or childhood, but it can occur at any age. And the disease is characterized by itching, a lot of it, pruritus. And the, and the skin examination, when we do examine the skin, shows a lot of erythematous, scaly patches and plaques. We all kind of know this. And often there's evidence of excoriation and lichenification. And it can be really anywhere. And in infancy, it can be in the face, the extensor surfaces. Um, in childhood, it can be in the flexural surfaces. It can be diffuse. So there's a lot that's going on that we know about in, in uh, atopic dermatitis in primary care. Um, Robert, why don't you start us off first of all. What's the prevalence of it, though? Atopic dermatitis is a common condition. It's seen in roughly one out of five kids in the United States uh, and up to one out of 10 adults. And that's pretty prevalent. And as, the, as a child develops this in infancy, is there a tendency for them to continue on into adulthood then? Is that right? Well, it depends. It's a lot of times you hear that atopic dermatitis, oh, your child will grow out of it. Yeah. And it evolves. I think that's a better way to think about it. Kids don't always grow out of every symptom, but they tend to improve with time but some patients do persist into adulthood, certainly, as Rael can attest. So yeah, Rael, so you had it since, what, childhood or infancy? Yes, uh, since infancy, straight out of the womb. <laughs> <laughs> so you've never, you've never known a time period without eczema then, is that right? No, no, it's always been in my DNA. Um, I mean, I've had ups and downs that it's been clear, mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, totally, my entire life. Has it changed at all in its characteristic as you've uh, gone through your... Uh... Yes, it has. Um, just through life and just reasons why um, I have developed other forms of dermatitis. And so, uh, yeah, so I just, I have maybe about three different kinds right now. So it started out as a topic, dermatitis. Well, let's talk about that, the different types of skin changes. I mean, in primary care, we see so many uh, infants, children, young adults, adults, and they have all sorts of varying skin problems. What's a differential diagnosis of eczema? How can we make sure that it's eczema or atopic dermatitis and not something else? Well, I think you alluded in your introduction uh, the most critical point. What I tell my residents is if it doesn't itch, think very hard about whether or not it's atopic dermatitis mm -hmm. because there are some other conditions that itch as well that can mimic it, like allergic contact dermatitis, mm -hmm. like scabies, but they usually present a little bit differently. Megan, do you feel similarly? Yeah, I completely agree. I think the other piece, a kind of pearl of wisdom, is to really focus on the distribution. So if it's not in the areas where we would expect to see it, like the flex areas, it should always spare the diaper. Um, those are some things to think about. If it's in an unlikely location, it might not be atopic dermatitis. So you folks are dealing with primarily in the pediatric population. Uh, in, in adulthood, it can be a little bit different, I imagine, uh, as far as also the differential diagnosis. But let's talk about the pediatric uh, population and their differential diagnosis. Are there things that we should look at or consider, even if it's itching, that it could be not uh, eczema or atopic dermatitis, but something else? Absolutely, the one that tends to hide the easiest is allergic contact dermatitis. Why? It is just like you said, but also because patients with atopic dermatitis are more susceptible to allergic contact dermatitis. And you can sometimes be allergic to one of the products you're using 
putatively to help your atopic dermatitis, so it can be really hard to untangle sometimes. So what kind of history do you get in a child, let's say, who comes in with an itchy rash, you know, a four or five year old, they've been scratching at it, it's lichenified, it's scaly, it's been going on for several months. Is there any kind of a, of a background history you do ask for, Megan? So I spend a lot of time talking about what they've tried so far and what has worked potentially a little bit because if it is atopic dermatitis, it should get better with exposure to steroid creams and some other treatments. So if it hasn't improved, then I think we need to rethink the diagnosis a little bit. Does uh, any kind of uh, past medical history or family history contribute to the information necessary to make the diagnosis? So I work in the allergy department, so we see lots of different varying allergic conditions, um, but eczema is often the first step of the allergic march. Um, patients often have family history of um, asthma, food allergies, and allergic rhinitis. Um, so often if we see that in the family, we worry a little bit more about this child developing atopic dermatitis. And perhaps that's the first step in their atopic march, and a lot of other allergic diseases may come. So aggressive treatment of their atopic dermatitis might help prevent future allergic disease. You, know, you mentioned atopic marsh. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. It's such a fascinating thing about how uh, the different atopic symptoms progress through, through the years. But let's talk a little bit more about the, uh, the differential diagnosis. Patients will often come in and say, I think that my child has a food allergy or, or I think that they have seborrhea because I had it or I have psoriasis. What do you do to distinguish those? Well, I think it has a lot to do with some of the things we've talked about, the family history, what's the risk of the condition, the distribution, does it itch. When you talk about adult patients, you reference the fact that we just see kids, that's right. But I think it merits mention that in adult patients, um, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, mycosis fungoides, can mimic atopic dermatitis. And that's when you really have to look to the distribution, the stubbornness, as Megan alluded to, to try and help you get to the right diagnosis. Well, that brings up a very important point, which is testing. Is there any kind of testing that, that you do or that we should know about doing, uh, whether it's biopsy or blood testing or skin testing? Any of those things play a role? They can. I think most of us, when we make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis in a child, don't rely on tests to do that. It's a clinical diagnosis. However, when you're in doubt, when you're not sure about the diagnosis, you can look to laboratory tests to support, uh, such as elevated eosinophils or elevated IgE um, in a child or specific food test allergens that are positive. In an adult, when you're worried about cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, that's when you really should biopsy. Okay, so, so a biopsy can potentially be something. So, Rayel, you were diagnosed relatively early. Uh, was there any doubt about the diagnosis? Was mm -hmm. it a straightforward thing and then treatment was begun? Yes, yeah, straight out of um, being born, I, uh, I actually felt like sandpaper, my mom would tell me. So uh, yes, so that was pretty clear. Um, there was a, something going on in regard to a skin disease. Um, and so from there, they just took it um, the best way that the doctor suggested. Well, let's take a look at some slides, and we're also going to talk about mild, moderate, and severe disease. Here's a picture of somebody who has, what, typical eczema that is occurring in the skin folds. Is that accurate? Very much so. And uh, this patient has probably had it for quite a while because it looks like it's, what is it, lichenified, and there's also a darkening of the skin. Is that typical? It's very typical, certainly, in patients with darker skin types. Uh, the more pigment you have in your skin, the more likely inflammation in that skin is going to sometimes make it darker, but also sometimes make it lighter. Is the fact that it's bilateral symmetrical make an impact on it? You know, I think that just really kind of drives home your diagnosis of atopic dermatitis if it's symmetrical. If it was asymmetrical, I'd worry about some type of contact dermatitis or some kind of contact irritant. But the fact that it's just completely bilateral. Any seasonal nature to this, by the way? Do you look to ask families, uh, you know, does this happen more in a winter versus summer versus spring? Is there any seasonality to it? So I think that's one of the most challenging things about atopic dermatitis. It's different for everyone, but um, certainly changes in the season. You might be feeling very well, and then, you know, we have an onset of pollen season, um, and we can have an increase in symptoms. When the weather changes dramatically, um, we can see big changes in symptoms. Yes, as you can personally, attest. I can attest to that. It's, it's like allergies, the for it comes out on your skin. So when it's big allergy seasons, it's big eczema seasons a lot of times. So when allergies act up, you're worried that eczema is going to act up. Okay, all right. So uh, on this slide, we see an infant with it. Boy, it looks like it's pretty badly scattered. Is this infant, is this infant uh, a, let's say, uh, unpleasant or, or behavior? Is the behavior also showing the role that the eczema is doing here? Oh, for sure. In all likelihood, this 
infant is very uncomfortable and is itching a lot, possibly not sleeping well, potentially impacting their feeding, their growth, uh, eczema to that extent can have wide-reaching implications. This is a pretty uh, diffuse case of it. Uh, we'll talk about treatment in a few minutes, but this is something we probably shouldn't, shouldn't miss. Is that right? Uh, yeah, and I think another thing that comes out of that image in particular is something that Megan alluded to earlier about most kids, it will spare the diaper area. Okay. And when parents come, having heard mixed messages about how to take care of their eczema, they may or may not trust me, they've just met me. And so I'll look to their child's skin when it's illustrative like that and say, hey, look what the skin likes. The skin likes moisture. Yeah. Just look what your child does better with. That's a very good point. Moisture, we're going to talk about that as possible treatment. A couple more slides though. Hand dermatitis, uh, this, this can be many different things. I mean, in my eyes as a primary care doctor, it's just hands peeling. Uh, am I thinking an allergic reaction? Am I thinking infection? You know, am I thinking psoriasis? Uh, what are some of the distinguishing features here? So I, I think hand dermatitis, when it's truly hand eczema, it's one of the hardest things to treat and you really have to aggressively treat with topical steroids. But I agree, you need to think about a lot of diagnoses before you go down that route. Do you agree? I do and, and this is similar sort of themes as we talked about before. Is it bilateral? Is it the palm? Is it the back of the hand? Here's one place where actually I don't think biopsies are super helpful because you'll oftentimes get a result that calls it psoriasiform dermatitis. And your biggest question perhaps may have been, is it dermatitis or psoriasis? And that's not a helpful answer. Right. <laughs> so it can be sometimes challenging, right? So maybe looking at the uh, historical progression of it and how they respond to treatment, as you said, can solidify a diagnosis. So, so sometimes it's not clear cut that it's a diagnosis of eczema when you first see a patient. Is that, correct? Is that accurate? Absolutely, okay. especially with hands. Especially with hands. And then uh, keratosis, uh, keratosis pilaris, we see this very often. Um, so keratosis pilaris is a very common skin condition that we see in patients who have sensitive dry skin. Um, it's common in our allergic population, but it's common in the general population as well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times people will think it's atopic dermatitis, but truly it is keratosis pilaris. You know, patients come in saying, I don't like the way this looks, especially, you know, young ladies sometimes, uh, Rayel, they're coming in saying, I want to wear, you know, the bare shoulder and there's stuff here and they get mm -hmm. concerned about it. Do you get concerned about the appearance of your skin? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's no doubt. Um, even, yeah, just for anything, like a special occasion. I, was, I went shopping the other day and I'm like, oh, can't wear that because it had all the, my neck showing and right now I have a flare and that's just not what I felt like having to show. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it definitely affects everything. Wow, okay, we're gonna talk more about that. But let's talk about lichenification. What is lichenification? Lichenification is basically a fancy way of saying thickening of the skin, and oftentimes it presents with what look like accentuated skin lines. And I will point it out when it's present because one of the concerns parents often have with the medications, specifically topical corticosteroids, is thinning of the skin. And there's a change that's the exact opposite of, of thinning of the skin, which I'll point out to parents. Yeah, do parents also ask and say, is this gonna scar the skin? Do they actually ask about that? Often. Um, and what's often. your answer? In general, not, but it's a very slow process. And the first step to preventing scarring is getting the active inflammation under control so that then the body can heal itself. Is it the, the itchiness or is it the scratching which causes the, the scarring? Yeah, so that's the chicken and an egg, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Okay. Um, it's both. Okay. Yeah, and then the, there's nipple eczema. What's that? Um, nipple eczema, as this image shows, is um, actually involvement of the nipple, which to me I think is really helpful diagnostically. You referenced earlier the differential diagnosis, and one of there, there are major criteria we've even talked about already today, and there are a lot of minor criteria we haven't. The most specific minor criteria in the diagnosis is nipple eczema. And then finally, numular eczema. Numular just means a certain patch of it, isn't that right, Megan? Yeah, so circular eczema in different patterns on the body. Um, and this can really get misdiagnosed, I think, if you're not familiar with numular eczema. Um, this is what it looks like, and it's uh, good to know and have a baseline for what you're looking at. Oh. And I, I was just thinking back to the discussion about lichenification, and I think a lot of times it's important for families to know that the healing skin will be the last for the pigment to come back. So um, the pigment, pigment will come back even though it's lichenified after it's been treated, the pigment's the last thing to return. I think that's really important for families to know. And you know, to summarize all the pictures that we've seen here, these are all patches that are very itchy, 
oftentimes inflamed, scaly, and dry, and it can really occur anywhere, but they have certain patterns, especially in the pediatric population, right? All right, well, let's talk about the pathophysiology. Why does this occur, and what's going on, Robert? Well, uh, for the longest time, I've got a lot of gray hair, so I've been uh, counseling patients for a long time that we just don't know. And in the last 10, 15 years, we've learned more. And one of the fundamental things we've learned is that for many patients, not all, there's a deficiency in a protein called filaggrin, which I sort of describe as almost like caulk for our skin that sort of keeps moisture in and prevents uh, allergens or bacteria or other things from getting in as well. Okay, that's a very important point. You already mentioned moisture and bacteria, which are going to be hallmark in uh, treatment methods uh, for eczema. Uh, and, and a little bit more about, about this. There's a picture here that we have about, about the skin and what's going on. Anything more we need to know? So I like to think of the skin, and when I explain to families, I think of the skin as either layers of brick and mortar, and the, the bricks are too open in, in these patients, and so you get the seeping in of allergens and microbes, and this deficient barrier, which can be helped by moisture and treatment from the medications we'll talk about sooner, will help to heal that barrier, um, and that would help reduce the inflammation and the inflammatory cascade that you'll see. So that's a very important point. Yeah, and I think what she mentioned right at the end, as you see sort of in, in the lower part of that pathophysiology slide, is that inflammatory cascade, because that's what we're learning so much more about in terms of therapeutic targets, which is what we're going to talk more about later. Yeah, so filaggrin, moisture, bacteria barrier, allergen barrier, these are some of the fundamental issues that we need to know about the pathophysiology. All right, well, let's go to treatment then, basic management. Um, so because of what we know so far, where do we start with management, Megan? So I take it all the way to the beginning, and families sometimes look at you like you're crazy by talking about bathing, but I spend a few minutes just to see what they're doing to take care of their skin. So we recommend a 10 to 15 minute bath in lukewarm water um, to soak, and then when you get out, using a soap that's mild in pH, um, or no soap at all if you're not dirty, and then really patting dry, not rubbing aggressively, and then moisturizing with an emollient. You wanna talk about some of the emollients? Well, I loved what Megan didn't say, which was um, we recommend a 10 to 15 minute bath, et cetera, et cetera, but without saying how often. Oh. And, I think, <laughs> and I think she did that for a reason. It wasn't an omission because there's no evidence to say that it should be every day or it should be once a week. And so often parents either read or are told that there's this rule that they must follow, and there's not. And is the reason for the bath to moisturize, or to take bacteria off the skin, or is it to take allergens off the skin, or all the above? All of the above, <laughs> it really is. But the key point about bathing is, if you bathe every day, moisturize. If you bathe once a week, moisturize. <laughs> That's the key. Oh, hold on a second, are we talking about going into a, a bath with a bathtub, or are we talking about showering as well? I mean, is there a difference? So submerging in a tub is better for the skin. It allows it to hydrate and kind of drink in that moisture. But if you have an adolescent patient and they're not willing to take a bath, yeah. then a shower it would, would suffice, just not too hot and not too long. So not too hot, not too long, 15, 20 minutes, lukewarm bath, and you put maybe some kind of a moisturizing or mild soap in there. Is that about right? S sounds right to me, and I think many of us will use as a teaching tool to parents and kids the sort of wrinkled fingertip rule. Um, if they're in the bath or shower long enough for their fingertips to wrinkle, bath's over, more or less, and then they get out, pat dry as Megan alluded, and get something on their skin before the fingertips unwrinkle. Rayel, bath's part of your life? <sighs> Absolutely. It definitely um, calms any inflammation. Like, I do it when I'm having an issue, such as right now, it's every day. So um, I do it every single day. Um, and if it's even worse, then I do it twice a day when I wake up, as well as at nighttime. Um, but a shower first, and then I get in the bath. So it takes about a good hour at, at least. So, okay. yes. Don't do boys, men give you a hard time that I don't want to take a bath, I'm going to take a shower. Do they give you a hard time about that? It can be a challenge for any, any, um, any gender, I think, and any age group to, because sometimes once the skin is inflamed, the bath can be irritating. Yeah. Oh, Have you had yes. that experience? Oh, yes. That it, it can burn. It can burn, yes. Yeah. Well, you also mentioned, though, that if you take a bath, you got to moisturize right afterwards. Is that right? Right. Any tips on that? So, as soon as you get out of the tub after you dry off, you'd apply an emollient of some sort. So ointments or creams are preferred from lotions. Um, there's less ingredients that can be less irritating in ointments, um, but sometimes they're greasier. So I really try to work with families to see what 
what the child will like or, or young, young adolescent would like and tolerate if they don't like the sticky feeling, then we could try something else. I tell families not to use anything with a pump because that's too thin. Um, so. and, and this is something that they do after bathing and is it from head to toe? Yeah, ideally, and I think everything that Megan just said is an ideal state. And uh, in general, um, my favorite moisturizer is the one the child will use because the best moisturizer in the world sitting on the shelf doesn't help. So I totally agree with every point that Megan just made, but we always have to be realistic too. Is there anything you tell them to stay away from? You said a pump. Um, you know, we in primary care oftentimes will say something like don't use perfumed um, lotions. Is that right? totally agree with that. Kids with atopic dermatitis are more susceptible to fragrance allergy, so I think staying away from those. Looking for labels that say hypoallergenic and knowing both that at least they're less likely to cause problems, but it doesn't completely exonerate them either is important. Well, let's go on a little bit more to the treatment and the different things. So we've talked about basic maintenance of the skin right now, moisturizing, bathing. Um, these are important. Um, as far as the bath is concerned, though, antiseptic, uh, is there any benefit to putting antiseptics in bath water, Megan? So I love bleach baths. I think they're a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing to have in your toolbox of care. It's a little bit of a hard sell sometimes with families. Mm -hmm. Did you do bleach baths? Oh, uh, yes, <laughs> okay. um, as of now as an adult for sure. As a, as a child, um, I was totally a lot of oatmeal baths. Okay. <laughs> and, okay. Yeah, so, but yeah, bleach, it helps. You just have to know what you're looking for your skin to feel like afterwards as to what you put in in a lot of times. I think that's a great point. So making sure you don't use the concentrated bleach when you mm -hmm. do it. Um, and you are really just submerging the child, sim same kind of 10 minute bath principle, submerging them in dilute bleach and water concentration, the same concentration as a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Families are reluctant to do it sometimes at first, um, but it can really make a difference for the kind of chronic need for mm -hmm. antibiotics and skin crusting and it helps yeah. remove the allergens from the skin. If they have a toddler who's um, very active in the tub, sometimes you can just pour it over their skin mm -hmm. if families are worried about it getting in their face or their eyes. Okay, so let's say a child has taken a, a bath with, uh, let's say, 12 inches of, of warm water. How much bleach do they put in there? So um, the recipe. Yeah, so I generally, I, the, the, the recipe is a teaspoon per gallon. I don't know too many families who are measuring out their baths. <laughs> so I'll say for myself, an adult with atopic dermatitis, a full tub, maybe no more than a quarter cup. Okay. For a baby, it's going to be a cap full to start and then see how it goes. And the very other thing that's critical is rinsing off at the end. I want the last water that touches their skin not to have any bleach in it. That's a very important point. So it's a small amount, just enough to help with the aseptic uh, uh, background that we're trying to get for the skin. So we've talked about skincare, aseptic measures. What about triggering avoidances? What do you, how do you counsel patients on, on avoiding triggers? So trigger avoidance is hard and it's very personalized. Some things that might irritate, uh, one person might not irritate another. Um, recently I had someone whose school uniform that was made of wool, it was a Catholic school mm -hmm. uniform, was very irritating. So we had to come up with strategies to keep some kind of barrier between the skin and the uniform. Um, but thinking about pollen exposure, some people are well controlled until they hit that soccer field and are, and mm -hmm. are playing in the spring. Um, so coming up with a plan to rinse off after they've been exposed can really make a difference. Dust mite covers in the bedroom can help if you have a dust mite allergy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything else. Yeah, no, I agree with everything Megan said. And I'll sometimes use that point about wool to sort of highlight what we talked about earlier about growing out of your eczema. Well, they'll probably evolve. It'll probably get better. They'll be less itchy, maybe to the point where they forgot that they ever had it. They will probably never want a wool sweater for their birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right, Real? You don't like wool? Yeah, I don't. It was a period that I, I wasn't allergic to wool, though, um, and but I still didn't wear it. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there a particular uh, fabrics that are safe to recommend, like cotton or something? That tends to be the go-to: is yeah. light, loosely fitting cotton. And All things right. that are tagless can make a yeah, difference yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah, some yeah. more on the market now. All right. So we've talked about the topical treatments like emollients and, and moisturizer. Let's talk a little bit more about. Uh, uh, inhibiting neurologic activation. How do we do that? And, you know, taking care of the itchiness, what do we do? Well, it's interesting because I, when I think about taking care of the itch, 
it is a neurologic pathway that is part of the pathomechanism, that, but that, those treatments that uh, specifically focus on neurologic pathways are not the ones that I start with. I tend to focus more on topical corticosteroids as first line. Uh, and then you have some downstream effects that clearly affect the itch and, and the neurologic pathway. So the first step is, is glucocorticoids. Now, there are various strengths. You know, we grade them from one through seven, I believe. Right. Uh, where do you start? Yeah, and it depends how old the child is, how extensive the problem is, if there's any pre-existing steroid phobia that might influence where you want to start. You want to try and work through that with the parents. But in general, a class six, which is the weakest prescription strength, an example would be hydrocortisone 2.5% for the head and neck, mm -hmm. uh, or areas that are covered like- Head, head neck and face? Head, neck and face, and exactly, face. thank yeah. you. Um, and then something more in the range of a class five uh, steroid, class four mid potency, something like trimcinolone 0.1% ointment for the body. So those things are a pretty standard treatment then. And you said ointment. Is it more commonly to use a, an ointment versus a cream or a lotion? Yeah, and it sort of harks back to the moisturizer discussion that Megan alluded to. Mo ointments are more moisturizing. They are a more efficient vehicle for the steroid molecule to get into the skin. They're also less cosmetically elegant. And so if you tell a 14-year-old to put some hydrocortisone 2.5% ointment on their face before they head out to school in the morning, that's just not going to happen. So, so this is a pretty common thing that for children to use and for parents to use them. It's been common for you as well, Rio? Yes. Yep. Throughout my life. Yes. Okay. Different kind of mm -hmm. creams and lotions in different parts. Very different. It's it's been a a, a jungle actually. <laughs> a jungle. <laughs> it's a great way to describe it. I think one pearl of wisdom I would suggest for the prescribing clinician is to print out a list. There's lots of things available on the National Eczema Association and the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, that shows all the different categories of steroids. So if insurance comes back and says they won't approve that triamcinolone, you can stay within that category and have a quick reference because there are many options um, within the steroid family. Mm -hmm. And do uh, patients, parents for their, for their children use and not use depending on what's going on, is that right? You don't ask them to use it all year round preventatively? Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that I see sometimes is patients come and they've been given a sample that's quite small or they've been told only you can only use this for two weeks. Yeah. And of course, as Rael can attest, eczema does not last for two weeks and then stop. And so it's really important for them to realize that this is a program over time. And yes, you need to have breaks to keep the use safe, but that you're going to need periodically to use topical steroids in an ongoing way. No, that's so important because even as the child grows, if he if she keeps it or he has it in teenager or you get older and you realize, oh, this works. This is clearing me up. I'm going to use this every day for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to really monitor your child. That's probably the biggest advice that I could give. <laughs> so we've talked about acute treatment. What about uh, maintenance treatment? And we've talked about some of the uh, different grades of corticosteroids. Um, what are some of the other medications that we can use for maintenance treatment? Yeah, so oftentimes the second line treatment we reach for most readily is the class called topical calcineurin inhibitors. Yes. And there are two of those, pimecrolimus and tacrolimus. They've both been around nearly 20 years now. They're not new. But neither are approved for infants, children under two years of age. And sometimes that's when parents are most afraid of using topical corticosteroids. Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes not the, the easiest solution for that group. Yeah. But that's probably my first second line choice. How about you, Meg? I completely agree. I think the um, calcineurin inhibitors give a lot of options for facial eczema. And when people have flares in the periorbital region, it can really make a difference mm -hmm. um, for their skin. How do you counsel them on it? I mean, they. Uh, there is, is there a black box warning on these medications? Is there, how do you counsel them on that when they say, I'm worried? That's right, and, and that's exactly what I was alluding to, because if parents are afraid of steroids, the balm for that is rarely a black box warning. <laughs> and so we will say that the black box warning is something that came out because they, these products were prescribed quite readily in infants when they first came out because they were so effective and were non-steroidal, and they were never approved for that age group. So the FDA came out with a really a proactive black box warning. There hasn't been any harm demonstrated from their overuse then nor since, but it's important for parents to realize that these are medications that they're also gonna wanna use with breaks, perhaps intermittently, steroids for a period of time, and TCIs for a period of time. So if you're using a, a corticosteroid and it's not working as well, you might add one of these TCIs uh, as a second line agent in combination or by itself? 
You absolutely, you can do either. They can be used as monotherapy if they're effective that way. But what I tend to use, by definition, they're second line. So I brought them in because either the parents were worried about the steroids or I was. And so then you say, okay, you can use one for a week and then your break from the steroid is a TCI. Use that for a week and alternate if you need daily therapy with prescription medicine. And one is called tacrolimus and the other one is? It's pimacrolimus. Pimacrolimus. Right. Any preference between one or the other or are they about identical? Oh gosh, you know, one's an ointment and one's a cream. Okay. So there is that element of it. The ointment, the tacrolimus, tends to be a little more effective in my opinion, okay. um, but it is an ointment. And so if that's a problem, then it's not really going to be used by some kids. All right, you know, earlier, Megan, you talked about this atopic march. What is it actually? So the atopic march is uh, the theory that um, allergic diagnoses can kind of present at different ages. And so the first allergic diagnoses diagnosis that we see is eczema. Um, that comes on first and then subsequently you can see on this yellow line on the graph asthma comes later. Um, allergic rhinitis and food allergy develop a little later. Some might argue that the food allergy starts earlier but um, but eczema can be the first first start of the the march towards allergic diagnoses. Um, and with the, the age, we see increased IgE levels within the blood. And so if we can quell the eczema, perhaps we could help prevent the downstream effects. So that's true then, if you treat the atopic condition early on, maybe the other ones are not going, going to be as, as prominent or readily apparent, is that right? Uh, some fascinating research. So, I mean, I guess I, I agree with everything that Megan said. The only other thing I will add is that she's seeing this through her allergic lens. And so using the term eczema as an allergic diagnosis, patients with eczema have more allergies, no doubt about it. Yeah. But what I want primary care doctors to understand is not every patient with eczema has a food allergy that's just lurking to be found that you can remove and make it go away. So I think that's important. The other thing is that, that she was alluding to, that you just alluded to, is there's some early literature to suggest if you just moisturize the skin really early in patients who are susceptible of, to getting eczema, you may not only prevent the eczema, but maybe even prevent some of these atopic comorbidities. That's a very important point. In other words, it's not just a little bit of dry skin now and then, but really being proactive, identifying the problem, treating it uh, thoroughly, may impact uh, the future development of other problems. You know, if you look at this graph, you kind of see that maybe eczema kind of gets better as the years go on. Is, is that accurate for us to say? I don't know, Rael, you wouldn't think that that's too accurate, <laughs> would you? Well, <laughs> um, I believe it, it does get better um, depending on maybe how your system um, connects to the medicine um, as to how it actually, because I know the steroids actually started working better for me as I was a, a teenager, older teenager in high school um, and through time. But, um, but yeah, once that kind of stopped working, then it just was horrible. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So one other thing, though, food allergy, you mentioned this. It becomes a problem. Parents will often ask me, are you going to do food testing? Should I get scratch testing? Or you want to do a blood test on? Should I do elimination? I heard eczema has to do with eggs. How do you answer those questions? Uh, Megan, so, you probably work because you're in the allergy area. Yeah. So. So, so eczema is hard, and my sympathies go out to every family that mm -hmm. is dealing mm -hmm. with it. And families want to do the right thing and, and do something. So if a mother's nursing, if she's able to remove something from her diet to make the child feel better, they try. Um, but families come in on such limited and restricted diets that really we want to focus on treating the skin before we eliminate things. Um, and, and the new peanut introduction guidelines from the NAI, NIAID peanut guidelines um, recommend introducing peanut early, especially those who have moderate to severe eczema after they've had some type of testing. Now that's a very important point uh, as far as introduction of peanuts at an earlier age. Uh, fascinating uh, area. But again, do we do uh, food allergy testing? And do we do blood testing? Do we do skin testing? So the risk with doing any testing on patients who have atopic dermatitis is they're in this hyperinflammatory state. So often we'll get lots of false positives okay. if we run blood work or if we do skin testing. Um, I think it's important to think about the mild, moderate, and severe cases of atopic dermatitis when we're thinking about food allergy. Um, if they have severe atopic dermatitis, the guideline does recommend that they have a specific IgE to peanut, a blood test, or a skin test or consultation with an allergist um, before introducing just because they're at a little bit higher risk or if they already have an egg allergy. Okay, very important points. Well, I just, I just think the best allergy test is a history. 
by all means, because you don't get false positives usually. You get good information that you can act on and then maybe test. So I think I loved what Megan said about you start with good skin care. And if there's not a clear food connection to something like an anaphylaxis type reaction, where clearly you're going to avoid that period, you can say to the parents, hey, let's not forget about the possibility that allergies may be at play here, but let's table it, do all steps A, B, C, D, E for good skin care, come back in two weeks, come back in four weeks, and if you're much better having not changed your diet at all, then a lot of those allergy questions sort of drift to the side. Excellent, yeah. very good to know. All right, well, let's talk now about itchiness. I mean, how bad is itchiness? How bad could it be? What's the problem with itchiness? <laughs> well, we should ask Grant. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. <laughs> Well, no, I mean the... Uh, oh, wait, yeah. really? Oh. <laughs> yeah, the problem with itchiness. Yes. It's, it's a pain, actually. It's, it's, um, it's doctors and there's, you can speak more on the, the neural effect, but it's, it's something going to your brain that there's pain happening. And so it's there's, painful? Yes, yes, it is. It's, um, and we all have a tingle, maybe a tingle um, like in our body or something, and it's kind of like static and... And I've even, I've done a lot of research, so there's like the German word for eczema is to boil over. And so it actually, it feels like you're burning. Um, so yeah. So, so it's not just itching, it's actually painful. Yes. I mean, in this, in this table, we see are more than 50% reported pain sensation with itchiness um, and, and many episodes per day. It could be disruptive to, to a person's life. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, when chronic diseases are compared in terms of their impact on the quality of life. Mm -hmm. Eczema is up there with things like cystic fibrosis and diabetes, which to some patient uh, providers who don't take care of kids with severe eczema seems like apples and oranges. And the way that I try to make that analogy is if any of us get poison ivy for two or three days, it itches like crazy and it drives us mad. Kids or patients like Rael who have atopic dermatitis itch like that 24-7. Well, let's talk about its impact on one's daily life. Does it, does it actually affect one's sleep? I think it affects the entire family sleep and the entire family's <laughs> right? functioning. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there's been really good work on the psycho psychosocial implications of atopic dermatitis now, and we see the impact on sleep. Children, when we exclude for other variables, um, like allergic rhinitis, are at greater risk to have obstructive sleep apnea, so we have to worry about dysfunctions in their sleep and then the itching that's causing them to wake up. So people who have atopic dermatitis have less efficient sleep. Their sleep is more likely to be interrupted. They co-sleep with their parents, which is not ideal for anyone. Um, and so it affects the entire family's functioning. We see more attention and focus issues in children that are older um, and school performance and behavioral issues are a significant problem in this population. I don't know if there's anything else. Oh no, I agree completely. And we have one of the sort of emerging comorbidities is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. And initially when those studies came out, if you subtracted sleep loss, that association went away. Because if you're tired in school, you get focus, you're fidgety, um, and maybe that's because you didn't sleep well. It seems now though that actually ADHD is real. And so for clinicians out there, that's just important to keep in mind that yes, sleep is disrupted, but don't necessarily attribute all fidgetiness and disruption and inability to focus at school to that without exploring the possibility of another diagnosis. So the comorbidities for eczema aren't just um, rhinitis and, and asthma and other allergy type symptoms, but you've talked about behavioral health problems, sleeping, uh, inattention disorder, also mood disorders, is that right? That's right, in the last six months, there's actually been six, three or four different papers about suicidality in atopic dermatitis. So the comorbidities in atopic dermatitis are ex large and expanding. And one of the challenges for we as clinicians is to try and sort which ones are just associations or which ones are real. So it makes it even more important for us to be really proactive about, uh, about identifying the condition and being very thorough in its management. Right, Megan? Absolutely, and I think really engaging with behavioral health colleagues if they ha if you have them available in your area, because I really think that a counselor or a therapist or some other strategy could help to help with the psychosocial impact. And certainly, bullying is common in this population as well. Bullying, yeah. uh, Rael, did you experience any of these uh, these issues as as you were growing up in school with with uh, atopic dermatitis? Well, mental health is very important just in general, and the fact that. To know this as a parent, I feel like uh, I, I'm 
clearly have had amazing parents because mm -hmm. all of this I understand is definitely, um, it affects so many. Um, but I feel like because they were so knowledgeable of all the things that you said, they pinpointed that with me to be the opposite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I really feel like I'm the opposite of a lot of the things. But with as I grow up though, I realized although I, I don't have those those personality necessarily huge personality things. I might have some moods and things. <laughs> but um, but I still I realized that all along it was there. I just was fighting it. Like and, uh, yeah, and I just um, chose to to be on the other side. But all along, yeah, it's still those things are are truly um, a part of it, and you should pay attention to it. Yeah. So did it affect your sleep? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am a insomniac to this day. Um, yes, um, and my family <laughs> as well, my, my father especially. And we used to just say, oh, it's, it's just genetics. It's like we are always up, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, it's reasons, <laughs> like truly. And do you think it, as a result of that makes you tired? I mean, we, we talked about it affecting your, your mood, your mentation, and, and your energy level during the day. It does mm -hmm. affect it then, is that right? Yes, absolutely. Throughout life, I mean, I started drinking coffee um, <laughs> ah, too early. I was probably ninth grade. <laughs> and so, and, and that turned into two or three a day for, throughout for my entire life up until maybe two years ago. But yeah, so. Yeah. Well, let's talk about itchiness and, you know, what do we do about that? Um, I think the first thing we said is trying to identify and eliminating the, the trigger factors. What else do we do, Megan, about eliminating itchiness or, or remedying it? So I think um, thinking about the best way to, to moisturize and, and treat with an emollient. Um, and the other thing that we haven't spoken about is wet wrap therapy. I don't know if that's something you used growing up. Okay. So there's lots of ways to perform wet wraps and to, to, to use wet wraps. And I think it's a great option for primary care, especially for families who are steroid phobic. Um, and the National Eczema Association has wonderful resources available for how to perform wet wraps and YouTube has great options of families actually doing it so you could see it and provide families with the links. Um, but really it is after the bath, you've, your skin is well hydrated, you put a cotton, um, there's lots of ways to do it, but if you just had involvement in the antecubital area, you would put a, you could cut a tube sock and put that moist tube sock over the area that has the thick emollient on it and it will hydrate the skin. It's important to not let it dry thoroughly as we were speaking about before, um, not letting the area dry thoroughly and then you can apply the steroid or the prescribed medication to the area because it won't be as thick, it will allow it for, to absorb better. And I think it's a great thing if families are willing to do it and they have the time implementing it once a week or twice a week if they're able can really make a difference in disease. I don't know mm -hmm. if you want to comment on that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with everything that Megan said. The, the other thing that I always think is interesting is we'll go through with parents in a sometimes 20, 40 or longer visit, all of these important points about skin care and inflammation and topical steroids, everything we've talked about to this point. And at the end, they're asking the question you just asked, which is, okay, but what about something for the itch? And oftentimes that's code for where's my antihistamine? <laughs> and we actually <laughs> feel like that antihistamines are effective for comorbidities like allergic rhinitis, uh, allergic conjunctivitis, but they really don't do a lot for the itch of eczema. So if you're losing sleep because of eczema or itching and you get some sedation from a sedating antihistamine at night, that's one thing. But just purely for the itch of eczema, antihistamines aren't terribly effective. I don't know, Ariel, if you've had that experience. No, it just makes me maybe go to sleep at night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, you know, uh, patients will come in, they'll even put topical diphenhydramine on. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the studies are not, not very encouraging for using the diphenhydramine topically. There's been some smaller studies about the use of melatonin in patients who have atopic dermatitis in that it can help heal the skin and improve the sleep. So um, larger studies are needed, but I think it's an exciting future perhaps um, so we don't reflexively give an antihistamine. All right, so we've talked about several different medications, uh, but one of them we haven't talked about so far is uh, Crisabarol. Can you talk about that? Sure, so that's uh, one of the newer medications just approved in the last couple of years. It's a non-steroidal topical ointment approved for kids two years of age and older. So again, not for kids under two, at least approved for that age group. And it's a topical phosphodiesterase inhibitor. So not a topical steroid, not a topical cal calcineurin inhibitor, a totally new class of medications. Phosphodiesterase, we didn't talk about that in the pathophysiology. Where does that 
fit in. I, I, I don't understand. Yeah, it's an interesting story that started back in 1993. Okay. John Hannafin showed that atopic monocytes produce less uh, cyclic AMP. And so from 1993 up until 2017, it took that long for there actually to be a molecule that came out and addressed that abnormality. All right, and how does, how does this medication work? How effective is it? It's so if you look at the studies, um, and um, our site was one of the sites for the trial, um, it shows that there's about 33% uh, or so of patients who are on the drug got to clear or almost clear. It's really important to realize that this patient population was mild to moderate, not moderate to severe. And about a quarter of that patient population got better with the vehicle speaking to the fact that actually putting anything on your skin, particularly an elegant vehicle like this product has, is going to help. So that's interesting. So we talked about topical steroids, then TCIs, and now a completely different way of doing it. Again, the question then is, is this used by itself in combination and what kind of combination? Yeah, so I think it's similar to the TCI story. It can be used by itself. It can be used in combination. When I've reached for it most are in those patients who sort of fit that bill we were alluding to earlier. They're afraid of steroids and the black box warning frightens them as well. And this is neither. Um, the question is, is it going to work for them? There's a fair bit of stinging with this product. It was about 4% in the studies. It's been more than that in real life. So that can be a barrier. Is it a cream or is it a? It's an ointment. It's an ointment and can be used in the face? It can. Okay, so, and as far as age group? two years of age and older is the FDA approval. Excellent, so I another alternative for us. All right, well, let's talk about, you know, since this is a novel item, any other new items coming out as far as treatment? Oh gosh, if we go into the systemic realm, um, well, maybe before we go there, there are an other topical agents yes. in the pipeline as well, including other topical phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Um, there's some good phase two data on a couple other molecules in that same category, so that's exciting. Maybe we'll have another product there soon. There's a class of medications called JAK inhibitors. Uh, topical JAK inhibitors are, uh, there's some studies being done there, some early data that's very encouraging. So to answer your question, yes, the, the future is very bright topically and beyond. Will these phase out some of the TCI and corticosteroid use do you, do you predict or will it just be an add-on or another option? Well, gosh, they've got to prove themselves. Um, okay. So I yeah. think if they do, then they may well, because as we've talked about, there's some barriers to using our old standbys, but they've got to prove themselves. Okay. Um, all right, well, uh, you said a few seconds ago about systemic agents. Please elaborate on that. So it's extraordinary. Um, between 2000 and 2017, there wasn't a single new molecule approved for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. Since 2017, there have been two. Um, one topical we've already talked about, one systemic called dupilumab. Dupilumab was approved in 2017 for adults. It was just approved uh, last week uh, for kids down to 12 years of age. So it's a very exciting biologic medication, uh, which is an injectable given um, the standard treatment dosing is every other week, so twice a month, um, which affects two specific molecules, IL-4 and IL-13, which are critical players in the inflammatory cascade that we referenced earlier. That's very interesting. Now, a systemic agent, but administered uh, subcutaneous, is that correct? Done every two weeks uh, by the clinician in the office or self-administered by the patient or the parent? I think the beauty of dupilumab is that you can do it at home, which is nice. So families have to be trained on how to use the injection, but it's fairly um, user-friendly. Um, and, and as long as you can get past the needle phobia with families, um, sometimes we still do it in the office for families if they're not comfortable, but um, it can easily be adapted into home routines. Now there are so many medications out there that are monoclonal antibodies to treat so many different things. Uh, we get concerned about local side effects or local area, uh, local injection area side effects, but also systemic side effects. What do you tell your patients to, to look out for? So we talk about all those things before. I think there's a, you need to have a really thorough conversation before you start a biologic in collaboration with a specialist. Um, thinking about um, being careful getting any new live vaccines is an important contraindication for dupilumab and other biologics. Um, making sure the injection site is, is healed nicely and watching those injection sites. There was a lot of injection site reactions in the studies. Um, but the, the one symptom that was seen in the trials, and we certainly see it clinically, is about 10% experience conjunctivitis um, as a side effect of the medication. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to. Yeah, and that conjunctivitis is an uh, uh, 
adverse effect we don't quite fully understand yet. Um, and it seems to be at greatest risk in kids who come into the use of the medication with pre-existing eye disease. So that's a question that, that can be screened. The other thing about this medication is that it is, first of all, foremost, it's new. And pediatric providers in particular are quite conservative with new medications. Yes. Having the approval down to 12 is wonderful, but we still want to be careful with it. That said, it is not broadly immunosuppressive like the medicines it's replacing, the systemic alternatives. We do, it's not recommended that you check follow-up lab work. So when you're talking about a medication that's an injectable, that's immediately a downer for a child. Yeah. But then you say, you know what, unlike the cyclosporin, we don't have to check regular lab work. Yeah. So there's a trade-off. So you said 12 and over, is that right? Correct. Uh, and it's every two weeks or so, no laboratory testing or whatever. But we talked about choice of patients. I imagine it has to be somebody with more extensive disease, is that right? Or maybe resistant disease? Yeah, both. And, and the other thing we, t we referenced earlier, mild, moderate to severe, and you can be, you can use severity indexes that not even dermatologists usually use outside the context of clinical trials. So I don't think for primary care providers that's really necessary. So then who's eligible? Who's, who's appropriate for this? Moderate to severe patients. You mentioned it. They're stubborn. They're refractory. They're not getting better. There can be extent of involvement. But then the critical question is, how much is it impacting their life? And if what you're doing is not getting to the point where they're able to live their life without being able to have sleep disruption, skin infections, pain, then you need to think about other options like this one. Yeah, we talked about the, uh, uh, the, the tremendously uh, uh, affected nature of patients uh, when they get the, especially the severe atopic dermatitis. So in some patients, this might be just the right thing for them to help in all aspects of their lives. Um, and I would note that it is approved for asthma patients as well. Um, so mm -hmm. it's approved for patients with asthma, 12 and up, wow, recently so, too. So patients that you, you showed me in that atopic march, so there's a point where in their teen years where they could certainly have a lot of atopic uh, dermatitis, but also asthma may be uh, important. Any other medications coming out in this, uh, in this arena as far as monoclonal antibodies? Absolutely. It's extraordinary, actually. Um, for years and years, we've seen one biologic after another for psoriasis. Um, and none for atopic dermatitis. Now we have the dupilumab we've talked about. Um, there are uh, quite a number of molecules targeting other um, cytokines. There's one targeting IL-31, which some people call the itch cytokine. Uh, so if you have a monoclonal antibody that specifically targets itch, well, that's, that's the, the, the holy grail, isn't it? And, and these are gonna go down to the age of 12. And you haven't predicted to go into the earlier age group because it seems like earlier than age 12 affects children really mm -hmm. severely. It does, doesn't it? And for the longest time, the FDA wasn't um, kind of encouraging trials in that age group, and now they are. And so there are trials going on, on down to six months of age with dupilumab, which is extraordinary and unprecedented. Um, Rael, how does this strike you as having an injectable medication? for uh, atopic dermatitis? If it works for you, then I mean, I think it's better than topical steroids, so that's how I personally feel, so it's good. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's go to this whole shared decision approach. I mean, in, in primary care right now, we use this concept of shared decision making. I mean, it's nothing more than honestly engaging with your patients so that you're both making a decision together. You know, it, it seems uh, like maybe a, a simple thing, but it's very, very important. In order for patients to, to, uh, uh, to have the best outcome, they need to be part of the discussion, don't they, Megan? I, I couldn't agree more, and as a nurse practitioner, this is foundational to my practice, and I think a perfect example, as you were describing it, is um, when I'm offering a patient a topical steroid, we talk about whether they are okay with um, um, the well, it depends which body part they're going to place the steroid. So if they don't like the feeling of an ointment on a hairy area like their legs um, or their arms, you could use a foam. Um, just thinking about what would keep them from taking the treatment approach that I would like them to do and coming to a mutual place that would be beneficial. Yeah, so, so as far as the, the shared decision making is concerned, we certainly do initially tell the patient what we think is going on. We give them as much information as we can in the best terms that we know about, in this case, atopic dermatitis, and then allow them time to, uh, to, to give us their thoughts and, and their concerns and apprehensions. Do you use any kind of aids or tools or, or pictures about, uh, for atopic dermatitis, anything at all? 
For sure, for sure. I mean, first of all, I think this shared decision making is interesting because it's this topic, this hot term for something that we should have been doing all along. Of course. Uh, as I love how <laughs> Megan put it, it's foundational to, the, to taking yeah. care of patients, period. Um, that said, your specific question about tools, there's something called an eczema action plan that's pivoting off of asthma action plans that probably many of our listeners are very familiar with. We've talked about a series of steps from moisturizers to topical steroids to topical calcineurin inhibitors. It gets very confusing. And so if then you can have a very dynamic based action plan for a parent to say, oh, when it's mild, I do this. When it's moderate, I do this. When it's severe, I do this. It's very helpful. Do you give them specific objectives as to, you know, what is our goal with a Like in a certain period of time, I would like for you to be um, th this well or uh, doing this well. Do you do those kind of goals? So I, I think it's hard to, to know how someone's going to respond to therapy. Sometimes it can be really drastic and quick. I use photos a lot in my practice, so um, I think it's important to keep having the patients come back if they have atopic mm -hmm. dermatitis. So taking a picture when they're at their worst at home using your cell phone um, and when they're in the office and the families feel like they're not better, but truly they're maybe 30% better. Mm -hmm. And they, to show them the picture really helps okay, we got to this point, what are we doing now? What can we do to make it another 30% better? So sometimes it's incremental, but. Mm -hmm. So what is your goal as far as treatment? Completely clear? Partially clear? 50% clear? So I think as the shared decision-making approach, it's what the patient's goal is. And so if it is, if sleep is their biggest issue to make that family make everyone sleep. Sleep is important for everyone. Um, but to see, I want to make sure there's the least amount of side effects uh -huh. in a patient um, and least risk of skin infections because untreated eczema is a risk for um, yeah. infections. You know, sometimes when we talk to patients, Rail, you may have even seen this, if a doctor talks to you, you're thinking of something, they're saying something at the end, maybe you retain, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 percent or so. So to me, it's kind of important to give them something to read or something to go to? Is there, are there any uh, reading items you give them or websites that they ask them to go to? Yeah, so absolutely. <laughs> I mean, this is critical, right? We've had this program, how long have we been talking now? And everything we've talked about, honestly, should be covered in a new visit for a patient with atopic dermatitis. How long are our new visits? <laughs> 10 to 20 minutes. It's, it's a disconnect. And you can blend that, or you can sort of bridge that disconnect by using outside learning materials as you reference. Um, the National Eczema Association is uh, one place that I steer patients to. There are other good places as well. Uh, resources um, like the University of California, San Diego, Rady Children's has uh, eczemacenter.org, which I reference uh, as well frequently. Eczemacenter.org? Eczemacenter.org. Okay. And there are others as well that provide good, reliable information. Uh, Megan, any other resources? So I, I rely a lot on my electronic health record. So I have kind of pre-populated eczema management plans that Dr. Sidberry was talking about. And I just will fill in whichever steroid or, or medication we've decided upon so that it can make my life a little easier and I'm not typing the whole time. And have pre-populated, if I want to focus on wet wraps, there's great YouTube links online for wet wraps. The National Eczema Association has wonderful resources when they have their annual conference. I'll put a link in for that if families are interested in attending if it's local. Well, that's excellent. Yeah. Um, one last question I want to make sure I ask before we wrap things up. Um, vaccines and immunizations, does that come up as questions uh, by parents to you when it comes to eczema? So I think absolutely. I think families are hesitant about vaccines yes. for lots of reasons. Um, and we are huge supporters of vaccines, even in our most allergic patients um, or most atopic patients. Um, but everyone should be vaccinated. Yeah, and I think it segues to a critical component of what I think is a follow-up visit mm -hmm. because there's so much information. The second visit when I see a patient, I love to have things that will cause their eczema to flare that are not allergies, mm -hmm. change of seasons, skin infection, anything that stimulates their immune system, including an upper respiratory illness, including a vaccine, and that is not to say not to be vaccinated. Yes. It's immune stimulation, which then therefore will probably cause an eczema flare in a day or two that you can easily manage. That is not an allergy to that vaccine and does not mean your vaccine should be avoided. That's a very, very important point. Well, this concludes our presentation on the management of atopic dermatitis in primary care setting. We hope you've found this program enjoyable and educational and that it's provided you with a foundation and overview on the diagnosis and care of your atopic dermatitis patients. 
Now for additional information on AD, please go to the National Eczema Association's website, nationaleczema.org. That's nationaleczema.org. And encourage your patients to check out eczemawise.org, eczemawise.org, an exciting new resource developed by the National Eczema Association. So on behalf of the faculty who've helped produce this activity, we'd like to thank you for your participation. I'm Dr. Paul DeGramji.